Good evening, friends, friends, colleagues, and fellow learners. Great to have you here this evening. My name is Gordon Smith, serve as the president here at Ambrose University, and on behalf of the faculty and the staff and the board, I welcome you to this year's edition of the Downey Lectures. Ambrose University, as we are wont to note and observe, is located on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy. We're here on the basis of Treaty 7 here in southern Alberta, and this treaty includes, with the Blackfoot Confederacy, includes the Tsiksika, the Pecuni, the Kunai, the Tsutsina, and the Stony Nakoda. This is also, Calgary is also the location of Métis Nation number three. We observe the Downey Lectures each year and very, very honored to be able to do so. The lectureship is named after Murray Downey, who was one of the founding eight faculty members of Western Canadian Bible Institute back in the early 40s. A few years later, my parents showed up and were his students, and then a few years later, I showed up. So I see a direct connection between the Downey Lectures and me. That may be an overstatement, but it's one of the precursors to Ambrose University here now in Calgary. And Mr. Dr. Murray Downey, he taught in the areas of theology, of Bible, and evangelism. And I am confident of this, that if he were with us today, he'd be very, very pleased that we were having a lectureship that focused on the particular theme that will be addressed this evening and tomorrow evening. We are privileged this year around to have Dr. Elaine Storkey with us, philosopher, sociologist, the theologian, who has taught on both sides of the Atlantic, both at the Contemporary Institute of Christianity, where she had leadership there, as well as with the Tear Fund. And one of the things that strikes me about her is this, that she is an academic and a scholar. She's also a woman of the church, deeply committed to the Anglican Church in the UK, but also through the Tear Fund and through other avenues has been actively involved in service, both nationally and internationally, of responding to those who live broken, fragmented lives and finding healing and restoration for them. She comes to us in part because she published recently Scars Across Humanity, Understanding and Overcoming Violence Against Women, a book, by the way, that's available for purchase in our bookstore this evening and tomorrow evening. And as is obvious, that is the theme of this evening's lectures, this evening's lecture. Dr. Storkey, it is with sincere pleasure and a distinct honor that we welcome you to our campus and to the lectureship this year. Please come. Welcome her, please. Yeah. Well, the honor is entirely mine. It's a privilege to be here. It's a joy to be here and a pleasure. And uh, I've really already enjoyed my time here at Ambrose and in Calgary, and I'm learning a lot day by day. The issue that you've asked me to talk about, sketching the global, uh, the contours of violence globally um, against women across the world, is one that I've been working on now probably for about 15 years. The book that was mentioned, it took me eight years to write, um, not because it was a particularly demanding subject, although it was, but because I could only write it in snatches uh, because of the emotional ladenness of the book. And consequently, um, what you have is really the product of a many years and a lot of talk, a lot of listening, a lot of meeting people, and a lot of encountering with some of the most broken aspects of our humanness across the world. Violence against women, of course, is not simply a phenomenon of contemporary society. Uh, the Me Too movement might have highlighted it, and it really has done across the globe over the last two or three years, and it's been highlighted as to how pervasive it is, but women have been violated throughout history. And the abuse of uh, being violated has been recorded in art, it's been celebrated in art. When you look at some of the uh, rape images that we have in our classical art libraries, it's been celebrated and seen as something very beautiful, something that we need to focus on. But of course, there's nothing beauty, uh, beautiful about rape. And it's seen being recorded in films and plays and music, sometimes in comedic form. If you've seen The Seven Brides for Seven Brothers, which is the most amazing, wonderful musical, it is actually about rape. And uh, we find it difficult to associate some of the things that are there in our art world and our photographic world with the reality behind them. And it's even been recorded, of course, 
in the Hebrew scriptures. And I want to first to start, therefore, by giving us a quick glance of the recordings in the Hebrew scriptures and see how uh, stories depicting abuse and brutality towards women are often really quite devastating. So if we look at the book of Genesis right at the beginning, already you'll see stories about Lot and his virgin daughters and the Sodomites. Genesis 34 records the rape of Dinah, a particularly brutal and horrid rape, which occurs really and then has recompense from that. Deuteronomy, uh, there's a law that says the rapist must marry his victim. And I'll leave it to you to think about what kind of marriage that's going to be for the woman or the girl, as it often is, who has been raped. To Samuel 13, you get the devastating story of Amnon raping his half-sister Tamar. And Judges 19, the rape of the concubine. I didn't ever come across the rape of a concubine as a young Christian. In fact, it was a bunch of radical feminists who took me screaming to that text to explain how absolutely ghastly our Bible is and its attitude towards women. And of course, you have a double take when you read it because there is more to the story than that. I think all of these issues are very significant and we have to ask questions about these. There are also, of course, issues in the New Testament and the story that everybody knows is the one in John 8, this woman taken in adultery who is to be stoned. The intention of the crowd is to stone her to death. And the Pharisees told Jesus that Moses commanded them to stone such women. In fact, of course, to some extent, the Pharisees have got something wrong. And I want to talk about all of these uh, stories later on in the talk, but I want just to, to send them here now as a marker. Right now, I simply want to say how much the stories that we have there in the Hebrew Scriptures and even in the New Testament display disturbing parallels with contemporary experiences of women. They might be a lot older, they might be long time way back in history, but as I've traveled the globe, I've found that they're also horrifyingly contemporary. Across North America and the Middle East, for example, North Africa and the Middle East, the penal code has long enabled rapists to marry their victims. Even in the case of child rape, where children of 12 and 13 have been raped by violent and brutal men, the penal code has allowed those men to escape punishment so long as they marry the victim. And the parents of the child are often only too happy for the child to be made clean, as it were, to be safeguarded, to actually have the rape wiped out um, and her virginity somehow restored by marrying this ghastly, brutal man. Wonderfully, and this is the good news, these laws have now been repealed, even in the last year and a half. In Egypt, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Jordan and Lebanon, and actually there's every indication that an awful lot of other countries that still have these in their rape catalogues will actually be starting to repeal them. But we have to recognize that these are the, uh, the ab abolition of um, Clause 522 was a big canvas, a big kind of protest, pleading with the government to repeal those rape laws. But nevertheless, other things have happened in contemporary society, which again have been heralded in those scriptural passages. The stoning of women is really very common, frighteningly common in very many countries. Um, it's, it's very interesting how it doesn't even have to go through courts of law. Uh, there's no, no suggestion that there has to be evidence that the woman who is stoned has committed any crime. Suspicion is enough to warrant her death penalty. And the death penalty is carried out by the community, the elder of the community, and very often members of her own family. What's the guilt of this particular woman? She was seen talking to a man she was not related to at the well. And then that opens a whole door to a catalogue of horrors that then are ascribed to the woman. Then also there are many um, areas where women are killed, stoned to death because they have brought shame on their family in one way or another. And if you look at the, what constitutes shame, it's usually stepping out of line of the family mores, 
choosing a spouse for themselves rather than the spouse that they have been allocated by their family. Or in many cases, and this is happening in your own country, in Canada, women are being killed by honor attacks from their own members of the family because they have become too westernized and the family has other designs on their future. All of this I document in the book that you've just mentioned, kindly, um, Scars Across Humanity, uh, and much more. But I really want us to look at the ways in which um, uh, the violence against women is ubiquitous. When I was starting to write this book, it got bigger and bigger because it started out just as a book about rape and domestic violence and how the two were connected. And then I realized that it was only the tip of the iceberg. It was actually a much bigger issue, a much enorm more enormous problem than I'd ever uh, understood. I first encountered violence against women many years ago when I became involved in counseling women who had been violated in, as incest victims in their childhood. And then that led more and more to helping people who were struggling with domestic violence but didn't want to go officially to a counselor or bring any charges against their spouse and so on, helping them to um, either adjust or to gain, regain their own sanity or to take some kind of autonomy over their lives so that they knew how to handle it. But it wasn't until I went to the Congo, um, the Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2006, that I realized that what I was seeing was part of a global phenomenon that had many different forms. Um, in the Congo, women were being raped. Why? As a weapon of war. It was cheaper than bullets. It was easily available. You could humiliate the enemy very, very quickly and very easily. And very often the women were raped in front of their menfolk, savagely, brutally, gang raped, and then the men were killed, having first been humiliated um, by the rape of their wives. It meant the attacking militia, of course, could also produce their own progeny, because in, if in the event of multiple rapes, the woman became pregnant, she would not be carrying the child of her own tribe or her own kin, she would be carrying the tribe, the child of the enemy. And the, they could also, and this became an increasingly powerful weapon I found when I was in the Congo, they could also inflict HIV AIDS on the woman, because many of the men doing the raping were already HIV positive. And that meant that they could condemn her to a slow and torturous death. I discovered so many myths surrounded rape in the Congo. Myths about virility, myths about fighting prowess, myths about manhood and manliness, that every rape that they did gave them greater strength in conquering the enemy on the field and so on. But whatever the, with the variety of motives, the outcome was the same. Barbarity and brutality was unleashed on the gentle, soft, vulnerable bodies of innocent women. The more I traveled then in different countries, the more I saw different forms of violation and realized that the violence that women undergo is often structured into the very nature of their society. And this became alarmingly obvious, but also frightening. Because if the violence is just a one-off, if it's just dysfunctional people savagely attacking a vulnerable person, we can deal with that. We can actually have educational programs, medical programs, counseling programs, legal initiatives that can somehow alleviate the problem. But if violence is structured into the very way a society understands gender relations, we can't do much about it until we begin to change the very structure of society itself. And that takes more than laws. It takes more than counseling. It takes a change of heart. It takes a spiritual awakening. It takes people being much more open as to what it is to be a human being. Very often, of course, these forms of violation are seen as cultural rites of passage. Sometimes they are clouded with superstition, as I found in the Congo. They can be for financial gain, and very often it's linked to economics in a culture or society. Or it can be familial patterns, um, 
encompassing so that melding families together in some kind of brutal way. Or it can be simple, sheer exploitation. And so if you take this mythical concept of a global woman, of course there's no such thing as a global woman, women are all situated in different places and times in society. But if there were such a thing as a global woman, and you asked where does violence, where is violence likely to take place in her life cycle, Traditionally, the answers that you get from most statisticians would be between the ages of 16 and 24, when, in a sense, the girl is past puberty and at her most attractiveness and so on. That is a complete and utter myth. Where you get um, the precedence of violence in the life cycle of a global woman is before she is born and right through to old age. There is no part of a life of a woman where she can be free and completely away from the threat or the fear of violence. And I discovered this when I was writing the book, and this is really why I want to share it with you tonight. It starts in the womb with selective abortion, and then quickly followed by infanticide, if the girl, in fact, is born. Then there's FGM, female mutilation, female genital mutilation, which occurs in 28 countries predominantly, and of course, here in Canada, um, people will be living with the aftermath, as we shall see in a minute. And then there's child brides. The legal age, the technical legal age across the globe for marriage is 18. Um, many countries have marriage ages far below 18. Some countries, including many states in the United States, have no minimum age of marriage at all. And I discovered that even in America, it's possible for girls to be married at the age of 10 in communities. And what kind of life is that going to be? And then there are honor killings that we've already mentioned. People stepping out of line from their culture, people arousing suspicion, people, usually women, doing something that they want to do off their own bat and finding themselves under honor attack or escaping from their, their families. And we have many women in the UK um, who are hiding their identity under assumed names because if their families were to find out who they are and where they are, their lives would be in danger. And then, of course, we know about intimate partner violence, which I'm not going to talk about tonight at all because tomorrow we're going to be looking at it much more carefully. But there's also trafficking and prostitution. And I want to make some comments about both those aspects of violence against women tonight. Um, and rape. Rape is ubiquitous. It happens in every society. Some societies are particularly brutal. The cities are the rape capitals of the world. Uh, some of them are in the Congo, but there's also Delhi uh, and parts of Egypt and so on. You simply take your life in your own hands in the whole area of rape. And then there's the issue and the place that I started with, sexual violence in war. I want to quickly to run through some of these uh, as fast as I can and then open the big issue. So why? Why? What is it about human societies? What is it about our humanity that we actually target women the way that we do in all these societies across the world? So we start with selective abortion. Because of India's preference for sons, and it's <laughs> widely assumed and uh, reinforced, over and over again in many different cultural practices and in India, uh, the dowry that has to be paid to the bridegroom's family, um, sex selection abortion is very, very high. And many people have argued, some of the campaigners in India, a man called Sabu George, who has given his life to actually trying to eradicate sex selection abortion, um, bringing people to uh, punishment and to court and so on. He argues that the first nine months in the womb are the riskiest part of a girl's life in India. And the <laughs> whole area of abortion means that as long as you've got a bullock, uh, can, a cart and a bullock that can go over stony roads, as long as you've got a path big enough to carry the machine, you can have an abortion clinic almost anywhere. And they do have an abortion clinic almost anywhere. Why? So that they can detect the, um, the sex of the child before it's born. And the figures, these statistics are very difficult to computerize. 
There's some suggestion that India has killed 10 million girls in 20 years. People say that's a very conservative estimate. It's far, far higher than that, but we will never know because a lot of these deaths are un certainly unrecorded. There were no official statistics, but also hidden from public view. There are posters everywhere. This poster says, spend 5,000 rupees now and save 50,000 rupees later. Why will you save 50,000 50, rupees? Because you won't have to pay the dowry. And the dowry that is given to the bridegroom family to take your daughter off your hands and become a patrilocal part of their family has become a heavier burden as the years have gone on. As India has become more affluent, the problem has become no, more acute. So technically, selective abortion and infanticide are practices of a poor society, a society that can't afford to feed daughters and then to save for the dowry uh, at marriageable age. But it's actually become a problem of affluence, even more so. Because as India becomes more and more affluent, the cost of the dowry has gone up. As your daughter is educated and wants an educated husband, the cost of finding that educated husband becomes prohibitive. If you have two daughters, that's double the amount. If you have three daughters, you may well be in debt for the rest of your lives. And dowries are often paid not just once, and they're huge dowries now. They can be yachts, they can be holidays abroad, jewelry, all kinds of things that were unheard of <coughs> a couple of generations ago. But they can also be paid in installments, uh, payment down before the wedding takes place, and then installments for the next 20, 30 years of a life. It's like a mortgage. <coughs> what we were discovering was that as parents became unable to pay the installment on the dowry, their daughter was likely to quietly disappear. And the late rate and level of dowry deaths in India has been going up exponentially over the last few years. Girls simply disappear because the families are no longer able to afford the dowry. As a result, of course, the man then can find another wife and another dowry and can start all over again. Why is this an issue for India? Because of the dowry, but also because of the attitudes towards the value of women. Women are simply not valued the same way. And the knock-on effect of all of this means that violence against women operates in many other ways as well. If you have a very um, distorted ratio, gender ratio in a society, <coughs> you will have more marriageable men than you have marriageable girls. And that means that many men in India will not get married unless girls are trafficked in from elsewhere in order for them to get married. It means many men will be very, very sexually frustrated. It means that there's going to be a lot more attacks on women, people taking their opportunity to vent both their irritation and their anger that they're going to be not married for the rest of their lives uh, on the women who are not going to be available to them. And so the, it's no surprise that the level, of div uh, the level of attacks and rape in Delhi alone are very, very huge indeed, and how many people uh, now in prison because of the attacks that they vent on women. These are the kind of posters that the government puts up. Save the girl, save the family. Many of my Indian friends are livid with those posters. Why are they livid? Because it's a sop. Because it's saving face of the government. They don't bother to um, actually implement the laws. They don't bring people to court. They don't kind of take them to punishments. They don't put them in prison. They put up posters, um, which implies it's the fault of the family and it's the fault of the girl who doesn't want to have a baby girl. So they're talking to girls, please don't abort your babies. But many, many surveys have suggested and shown it's not the girls who want to abort their babies. It's their parents-in-law, by and large, who want grandsons. It's their husband who wants a son. And it, we've even got to the stage where women are taking their parents-in-law to court because they have been forced into abortion. And if I had lots of time, I'd go through a lot of the cases that we've been studying recently. 
<coughs> but selective abortion isn't the only way <coughs> of disposing of girl babies. Infanticide um, has always been an issue in India for many generations, and it hasn't gone even with the possibility of selective abortion. And stories are unfolding all over where children um, are found, the bodies of children are found in pits, being exhumed by uh, soldiers and so on. But this particular child um, was dug up alive when boys who were playing in a field close by saw a hand peeking out of the soil. And they ran to the farmer who was about to plow the field and said, please don't plow the field, we think there's a baby there. So the farmer got off his uh, tr truck and ran over and did some digging and brought this baby out alive. And the baby was then taken to a health center where she was resuscitated and is now in good health uh, in her early teens. They have made an incredible uh, job looking after this baby. For every baby they rescue, there are hundreds, maybe thousands, we don't know, who never actually make it to the surface. And consequently, there are orphanages all over India where babies are placed in a little alcove so that the uh, bell rings when the weight of the baby goes onto the alcove and people know that yet another baby girl has been deposited with them. You pay tribute to the incredible number of women and men running these orphanages, many of them Christians, um, because they care enough about these children to rescue them. But the real issue is, is the culture itself needs to do something about the whole area that we're in. Then, of course, <coughs> female genital mutilation. <coughs> you will know a lot about, I'm sure, because it's hit the headlines so many times. Even here in Canada. It's very often performed on minors, that is, children. Um, it's performed without anesthetic in most of the 28 countries where it is performed with very unhygienic methods and so on. And people living with the aftermath exist in nearly all the Western countries, right across Europe, right across North America. A report of FGM in 2014 by our own government said that there were about 140,000 women living with the aftermath of FGM. And it's a horrible situation because it affects every part of their body. About 10,000 girls every year are likely to undergo cutting. It's illegal. It's illegal in most countries of the world. It's not illegal in countries like Sierra Leone, but that's a very big different issue. And yet it takes place, it continues. And so the, in Britain, in fact, the, that rate has gone up. We now, the figure now is suggested to be closer to uh, 200,000 than 140,000. Survivor activists have forced the government into action we now have helplines for girls at risk, specialized clinics for survivors, training for teachers to spot vulnerable girls, and a mandatory reporting requirement of FGM cases in all our health and social services. Professionals and teachers can be brought to court if they willingly and knowingly ignore the threat of FGM in their services. In February this year, we had our first ever conviction of a mother who forced her three-year-old daughter to undergo FGM, and that woman is now in prison. We know it's not the only case, but it's one that we were able to nail. It's a barbaric practice, and as I said, often performed on very young girls. I'm sure, especially if you've taken Dr. Singh's K, uh, study and course, you'll know what it entails, you know, the, the notion of what it really means. But I just, for those of you who haven't taken that course, and those of you who are yet unfamiliar with FGM, I, I want to kind of um, make the hairs on your neck stand on end as I tell you these horrible details. Clitoridectomy is the least invasive form, and all it does is remove the hood and the part of the clitoris where women will get sexual pleasure from. Um, it's a, still a horrible procedure, and it's still completely unnecessary. Excision involves removing a lot more of the clitoris, along with the labia that actually enclose it. 
But the worst kind, of course, is infibulation, often called a pharonic or Sudanese type, and it's extremely invasive. It cuts deep into the genital area and actually um, takes away just about all parts of the genitalia that you can remove and then stitches the girl up, otherwise her insides will drop out. And about 15% of all cases of FGM are of this brutal kind. There are no known health benefits whatsoever. And when I've talked to girls, women who have undergone um, all of these devices and all of these kind of uh, procedures, the story is horrendous. Uh, and we now know a lot more about the story because the Sudanese and the Somalian populations of the United Kingdom have come out and told their stories. They've told them to Sudanese health workers, Somalian social workers, and doctors and so on. And because of a woman um, who has become very prominent called Hebo Wadder, uh, who herself was cut at the age of six, has decided to be a campaigner and make sure that no girl um, knowingly is cut in the United Kingdom. Very often, of course, they're cut back home. They're taken home to be cut. And uh, that's part of the problem. The problem, what happens to the girl? Well, many girls, of course, die during the procedure. Why wouldn't they? Septic shock can set in very quickly. And others still suffer for the rest of their lives. Infection, excessive bleeding, difficulty in passing urine. They're all common immediate effects, but then so is scarring and the scars can produce problems for the rest of their lives. Excruciating intercourse. What's going to be a wonderful wedding night uh, usually ends up in a hospital with multiple bleeding and very difficult to actually do any repairs. Kidney impairment, infertility, fistula pain, and so on. It just goes on and on, and we know a lot about it because women are telling their stories, um, we're having meetings, people are discussing all of this uh, openly and in public. And then the stitching up after surgery. Why is that necessary? For, well, for two reasons. First, to make sure the girl's inside stays intact, but also so that in the cultures where it's, uh, it's practiced most prominently, the bridegroom's family has the right to inspect the bride's body to make sure she has not been tampered with before she marries their son. Can you imagine that? that the body is actually examined and the stitches are still in place and nobody has touched them. What does the stitching mean for the girl? It means she just has a very small hole for menstrual blood and urine. What used to take 30 seconds to pee before FGM now takes 15 minutes and it's excruciatingly painful. Why? Why? And that is the question that many women in the UK are asking as they go to clinics and have examinations and uh, go through this barbarism. And the answer why is largely because it's a cultic practice. It's uh, important that the woman's sexuality is not tampered with, that the woman is not promiscuous, and that she doesn't enjoy sexual pleasure. Uh, because her sexuality doesn't belong to her, it belongs to the man whom she is going to marry even if he has other wives as well. All their sexualities belong to him. And therefore, she has to be maintained in this extraordinary way. FGM was added to Canada's criminal code, I expect you all know this, in 1997 under Section 268. It was added as a form of ag aggravated assault. It wasn't a special category on its own. But it means that anybody who is involved in FGM can be charged by the law officers. And parents who willingly participate in or plan for the practice, for example, can be taken to court, can be charged because they're performing a criminal offense. Also, as with most other countries, it is illegal in Canada to take children out of the country to have the practice performed. Um, it's illegal to go for vacation cutting where the child is taken back to another country where there is no question asked about being cut. And actually, the criminal code indicates that any person who commits a aggravated assault could face imprisonment for up to 14 years. We know, we know the practice takes place widely, even in this country, but no convictions have ever 
yet been made. One thing I discovered when I was doing the research for this lecture for you was that there were no, yet, no protocols yet in Canada to save girls from FGM. I was very surprised at this because we have had them in U the UK for the last 15 years. We've worked very hard to maintain those protocols and to keep them active. As far as I can see, and if you know something different, I'd be really glad to be um, in, in, in told about this. I'm longing to hear that I'm wrong on this issue. If I'm wrong, please let me know straight away. But as far as I can see, there's no official training for teachers, and there are no systems in place to spot girls and to save girls who are actually in danger, who are at risk of FGM, or who are struggling with FGM afterwards. For survivors who come here already cut, they need specialized help. And as far as I can see, there's not any training to give them specialized help as to how to cope with FGM. There are no official statistics on FGM here in Canada. Yet immigration figures, if it goes anything like the figures in France and the figures in the UK, um, it suggests that there could be about 80,000 women who are suffering the aftermath of FGM. So I think it's really important that um, we get to the, um, the bottom of this and that Christians take a place in actually advocating against FGM in all the cultures where it happens. Why don't we? Why don't Canadians jump up and down, scream off their heads and say, this is a barbaric practice? Well, for the same reason that we didn't in the UK for many, many decades. And that was because we were frightened of being called racist. It's not our business. It's not our race. It's not our culture. We have a large immigrant population in the UK who do their own thing and they must be left to do their own thing. And okay, we don't like some of the things that they do, but it's not our business. What's happened in the UK is that the people whose business it is have got very angry with us, with us who are the indigenous population of the UK, and said, but if this was happening to a little white girl, if somebody took a little white girl and started cutting away at her genitalia and then stitching her up, you'd scream your heads off. You'd shout, this is safeguarding needed here. This is abuse. This is appalling. We'd be marched, frog marched down the street. People would be vilified. They would be brought to court. We would eradicate the practice immediately. So why don't you do it when it's little black girls? And that has actually seeped into our consciousness in the UK. Why don't we do it? And now, of course, we do. We're wisened up because we have stood alongside those, particularly the women, because it's mostly the women who are wanting to end this process, just as it's the women who keep it going in all the cultures where it is kept going. It's the women who are the cutters and the women who are paid to be the cutters. But we have largely begun to stand alongside those campaigners in the UK who want to um, see the end of the process. We've even developed some mechanisms for actually trying to do some kind of reversal surgery. Reversal surgery opens up the vagina, but the name is misleading. It doesn't replace, it can't replace any removed tissue. It can just make the situation slightly more comfortable. Deinfibrillation helps, but FGM is a life sentence. The other things that I want to quickly mention um, is the whole issue of child brides. We can't, uh, again, spend a lot of time on this, but there's no doubt about uh, the way in which it's been talked about now and treated amongst enlightened populations right across the world. Uh, Obadiah said this comment here, it's, this isn't marriage, it's rather the selling and buying of young women. And the stats, um, are, again, are fairly horrifying from a global position. Every day, nearly 40,000 girls are marrying underage, very often to older men, almost always without their consent. Nobody asks them if they want to marry, if they express um, an unwillingness to marry, they are unheeded. These are quite typical pictures from the Middle East and North Africa. What happens when a girl marries? Of course, she becomes pregnant the moment that puberty occurs because she is not able to discuss safe sex, 
The man is not usually interested. She has no rights. She's totally and utter vulnerable. Many girls die in marriage. Uh, many girls die in pregnancy. But even if they don't, their health risks are huge, not only to their own immature bodies, but also to the risks to the babies that they're carrying. The social risks are huge too. Their loss of childhood, loss of education. If they're known to be uh, on the marriage threshold, they're simply withdrawn from school, and that's the end of their life education. Financial dependency on the man who has taken them as their bride, and are often negotiation, negotiating relationships with the other wives. Um, uh, they will be low in the pecking order. They might even be violated by some of the other women. Limited future prospects and a very high level of um, likelihood of violence. We now have many stories, even a full-length film, of a girl who runs away from a violent husband um, and actually manages to get to a, a court and manages to get some recompense, but those are very, very unusual. Most of the girls, uh, their life effectively ends on the time when they marry. They can be looking after older children, younger children. They can be struggling through childhood into adolescence, and many of them die very young. We've mentioned honor killings, and I don't want to spend any more time on it, um, except to say again that it's also happening in our own country. Honor killings and child brides in a curious kind of way often go together um, in, uh, in countries where people have come in. This was an honor killing in the United Kingdom. It took us nine years to bring these parents to court. The girl on the left in the photograph, Shafilia Ahmed, uh, went missing. The, girl, the parents went on television sobbing and pleading with the British public, whoever knows where our daughter has gone, please, please kind of bring, them, bring her back. Don't touch her, don't harm her, we love her so much. They went on, on, on television roughly a month after she's disappeared, and only when the school kept asking where she was, where her friends kept raising questions and so on, and then there was this incredible display of affection and loss and tears and everything. Nine months later, the parents were brought to court and are sent um, currently serving <coughs> a very long prison sentence. <coughs> Why did it take nine months? Nine years, rather. Why did it take nine years? Because the whole community closed ranks around them, even though they knew the likely outcome of what had happened to their daughter. <coughs> and it was only when Shafilia's younger sister broke ranks with the family and described the kind of life that her sister had had, that the case was reopened and the parents <clears throat> brought to justice. Shafila, in fact, was suffocated. She had um, cellophane and a plastic bag stuffed down her throat until she finally could breathe no more. And then her body was packed in a bag and a trunk and buried and disappeared from public view. She's not the only one. It happens, um, the many, many women are on the run, <coughs> as I mentioned earlier. This young woman and her husband came to the UK. She had fled an abusive husband in Pakistan, <coughs> a man who was some 30 years her, or her senior, who abused her and violated her, and she divorced him and then remarried, finding someone, even from her own tribe, from her own religion, and they came to settle down in the UK. Her parents wanted to be reconciled to the girl. The husband pleaded with her, please don't go. I don't trust them. He by now was a doctor. They were living a very happy life, surrounded by good friends in their neighborhood in Birmingham. She said, no, I must give them a chance. I must go home. She never returned. The parents reported she had died of a heart attack as soon as she arrived in the home. Um, it's very evident from all the research that's been done that they murdered her and that her body has been disposed of and they have not been brought to justice. So this is happening in our own midst. Uh, it means that many women on the run in the UK, I have many friends who told their story, a hidden identity, will not reveal who they are. <coughs> and if anyone found out, their lives would constantly be in danger. There are even organizations set up to protect girls, both from honor attacks 
and from being married off to people that they don't choose to be married to. An organization called Karma Nirvana that is run by an Asian woman who herself escaped from a forced marriage. She refused to go into the marriage, ran away from her parents. Her sister was married against her will and took her own life, uh, drinking bleach because she couldn't bear the violations from her husband any longer. This woman, Yasmin, who is a very fine uh, advocate for against violence against women in our culture and has worked really hard with Karma Nirvana, is a lifeline for particularly Asian girls who are in danger of honor killings and being taken back home uh, to marry off and so on. And one of the things, the very interesting things that happened in this lifeline happened about two and a half years ago. A girl phoned in using the telephone exchange to say she was frightened. She was now 13 and a half, nearly 14. Her parents had told her that that summer she would be going back to Pakistan for a wedding. She was afraid it was going to be her wedding. The parents didn't disclose this at all. She couldn't defy her parents. She couldn't run away from home. She had nowhere to go to. She did not know what to do. She did not want to be married against her will to someone in Pakistan. What should she do? <coughs> She only had a minute and a half on the telephone before her father would return and would snatch the phone from her. And the woman at the other end of the phone, another Asian woman, Pakistani woman, who knew exactly what this girl was likely to face, thought very quickly, prayed quickly, the woman was a Christian, and said, put a spoon in your underwear, put a spoon in your knickers. When you go through the uh, security gates, the bell will ring. They will look at the, the screen and they will see that you've got metal object in your underwear. They won't undress you in public. They'll take you into a closet somewhere and you can tell them, tell the officials, I think I'm being taken back to Pakistan to be married off. They will then take you into a safe house and they will arrest your parents and interrogate them. And that's precisely what happened. Parents were arrested. The girl was saved, she was taken into care, she was glad actually to be out of her family and she has been preserved. They could only do that for a short time of course. The spoon campaign as it became known um, <laughs> was so effective that the parents and the people who were actually promoting these uh, practices soon got wise up to it so they have to think of another process to prevent the girls from being married off or uh, from facing honor attacks and so on. So you can see it's uphill work. It's going on constantly in communities trying to alleviate and trying to take the pressure off young girls who are constantly at risk. And moving around the, 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 the cycle uh, into trafficking and prostitution. I think the craft trafficking and prostitution um, is an area, certainly trafficking, where Christians have actually wisened up. It's tremendously good that in the West, Christians are taking a stand against trafficking. Trafficking now occurs in almost every country. There are traffic flows, well-known flows. They're not hugely uh, distant flows. It's quite normal for people to be trafficked into the next area, the next country, rather than halfway across the world, because the further you trafficked, then the more likely you are to be picked up by the police somewhere on the risk. <coughs> so traffic flows are quite local, uh, but they also travel a long way. And there are people trafficked in Canada, as you will know. And if you look at the pie charts, you'll discover this is an old pie chart, slightly out of date. But men and boys are trafficked as well as women and girls. Um, but predominantly men and boys are trafficked for military service, for um, labor, for uh, low paid labor and girls and women are trafficked predominantly for sexual services, for prostitution, for domestic work, um, sometimes for marriage, uh, child brides, and so on. And it's, it is good that Christians are actually taking an active interest in this, and there are many organizations working very hard on the whole issue of trafficking. Um, and we, we, we applaud that. But actually, very often people have drawn a huge distinction between trafficking and prostitution arguing that trafficking is wrong, and we can see it's wrong, because it involves coercion. But prostitution, well, it's wrong because it's immoral, but it's a free choice. 
The women who are prostitutes choose to be prostitutes. They see it as work. And so even though it's morally wrong, um, they're their own agents. It's their choice. Women are working for prostitutes, uh, re reasons that they choose to do themselves. I think most of us now seriously challenge that perception. Most women who work as prostitutes are there for reasons way beyond their own control. They're there because of childhood abuse, because they have run away during adolescence, because they have low educational levels, levels of poverty, drug habituation, a whole range of issues that are there in the, <coughs> the process of becoming prostitutes. So just as people are sold into the sex trade, um, prostitution also involves many women entering the sex trade with very few resources to avoid it. And in the UK, it's been very, very interesting how the people who have been most vociferous um, against the prostitution, against the, uh, the, the participation of women in the sex trade are not Christians. We haven't been very busy about it, although we have become busy over the last 10 years um, and become far more protective towards women in prostitution. But the ones who've led the, the, um, <laughs> led the theme, as it were, have been largely the radical feminists. And their argument goes something like this. No woman enters prostitution as a career. It's a myth. Because if it were, if it weren't a myth, we would have careers advisors going into schools saying, OK, have you thought about nursing or human resources, maybe IT? And what about prostitution? What kind of career do you want? We don't do that. And girls going into prostitution don't think, now, would I, would I be best as a teacher or a prostitute? Now, what would, be, what would be the best kind of career to follow? It's a myth that this is a career. They enter for all kinds of other reasons, as I said, be beyond their control. And consequently, because most girls are prostituted rather than are prostitutes, they're collected by pimps on the streets because they recognize vulnerable women. Many of these uh, men have actually even done courses, so they know how to persuade, how to befriend, how to cajole, and how to trap women into prostitution. Um, because that's the way that they've gone, by the time that they are ready to exit prostitution, and it's very, very difficult to exit prostitution, they will have amassed in the UK a whole stream, stream um, of uh, prostitution convictions that means that they have a, will have a criminal record as long as your arm. And this is precisely what happened to this woman here. Fiona Broadfoot is her name. And she was pimped at the age of 14, put on the streets by her pimp in Bradford, and then she was so successful, they sent her to London. Um, by the time she was 22, she had amassed so many convictions for soliciting on the street, because if you're visible to the police, then you're taken in and you're convicted, and you can even serve a prison sentence and so on. She exited prostitution um, in her late 20s, largely thanks to the women who helped her out of it, women who were actually radical feminists um, and found another way of livelihood for her, and then they took up her case. And what you see here is outside the High Court in London. She eventually went to the High Court because she found that from the time that she left prostitution to now, and she's in her mid-40s, she was never able to get a job she wanted. She was never able to join a college course. She was never able to look after children. She couldn't be a classroom assistant. She couldn't be anything because she had all these convictions that could not be expunged. In Britain, as in Canada, if you're convicted for a felony, then after a certain number of years, your conviction is spent and you don't longer have to record it on application forms. She had so many convictions, it would take two lifetimes before she could expunge them and before they were spent. So she went to the High Court and said, I did not choose this way of life, it chose me. I felt forced into this, I was, this is her story. He groomed me, he took control of me in a really powerful way, trafficked me from London to Bradford, put me on the streets, threatened to kill me if I didn't comply with his demands. That day, I lost my identity. I lost my self-worth. I ended entrenched in a violet world 
for 11 years. The High Court didn't know what to make of this. It had never been asked to expunge. Uh, I can't remember how many convictions before. So they let the case go into abeyance. They sent her off with her solicitors, um, these wonderful women who had supported her, um, and thought about it for the next, uh, well, they said six weeks they needed. Three weeks they came back and said, okay, your offenses are spent, your convictions are spent. We will now wipe them off your record. And that's been a massive change for women in prostitution in the UK. It's meant that <laughs> they can now walk free. And the wonderful thing in the UK is that there are many, many Christian organizations working with women in prostitution, helping them to exit if they possibly can. Um, it's hard work. It's difficult work. It's thankless work um, because these women are seriously damaged. But it's work very often that Christ is asking us to do as Christians. I want to whip very quickly through the rest because I've got quite a lot to tell you and time is running out very fast. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these because we've seen some of the uh, effects already in what I've said. The, uh, I just want to mention that in terms of conflict and war, women are 80% of all refugees. When you think about these internment camps, uh, these displaced persons camps and so on, you never ever see on a news item the level of rape that's going on in those camps and the level of violation of women, the level of teenage pregnancies, the level of forced prostitution and so on. These camps are enormous, like huge cities, but without any of the infrastructure that a city has, without the police force, without the social work agencies, without doctors and so on. Um, and somehow or another, there's so much work that has to be done in these areas looking at these um, aspects of, um, of, of kind of camping and looking after people. I did want to mention one other thing about <coughs> sexual violence in war. This incidentally is a hospital in Goma in the Congo and these women are recovering from fistula operations having had multiple rape experiences. <coughs> when I was there um, it was very obvious that the the, this particular Christian hospital had been serving the community for many years, helping people who had been violated in war um, by landmines and a whole range of other things. When they decided to open their doors to rape victims, it was a whole new ball game. And the interesting thing is one, they put a list of notices up around Goma and said any woman who had suffered um, sexual violence could present herself to the clinic and she would be treated. They then started a prayer meeting on a Monday morning at half past six and wondered if anybody would come. They said that by half past seven they could hear people coming and by quarter to eight they could smell them coming because they came with prurient bruises and wounds with blood um, pouring from them with ruptured bladders and so on. And then they had to barricade the doors because they couldn't contain them all. And these are people recovering from operation. I've been in touch with the hospital for a very long time but the whole area of violence in war and violation of women goes back over and over again. This, this, is, uh, this is Japanese, this is Japan, um, this is the uh, indo sinic Wars and the, first, and the Second World War, where women were taken from South Korea and the Philippines and many other countries to actually service, they were called comfort women, to serve the Japanese military. Um, many of them never came back, most of the women um, suffered incredible violent atrocities. They were all infertile. The women I met in South Korea when I visited um, were very, very old by this stage and suffering. I want to tell this story just because it's, I think it's a very poignant story. This is one of the comfort women we talked to. The woman in the middle heads up the global, or did then, the global YWCA, working on behalf of women and girls across the globe. She was telling her story of what it was like in these Japanese military camps, servicing the soldiers, sometimes 14 a day. How many girls committed suicide, uh, how many girls had to, be abort had to abort and so on. And it was a horrible story. There were eight of us listening to her. With me was a young Japanese woman, um, well, in, in her 40s by this stage. And when she heard the story, she began to back off. Um, move away from the group. And I 
sensed immediately she was in pain just listening to the stories. So I joined her and we both backed off together. And I said to, this, to her, this must feel terribly difficult for you to hear this. It must be awful to hear the story she's telling. And she looked at me and made complete eye contact and said, but I never knew. I'm in my 40s and I never knew. They never told me. It was never mentioned at school. It was never in our curriculum. I never knew. And that phrase, I never knew, kind of recall. And it was painful for her to be confronted by this in South Korea by a woman who had been violated by the soldiers from her country. Interestingly, I wasn't the only woman who'd recognized that this woman was in pain listening to the stories. A moment later, this woman here, the Halmoni grandmother, the comfort woman, had joined us and began to speak in Japanese to my friend. And uh, the girl in Japanese replied, and then I backed off and left them to it. When I looked over, they were there with their heads on one another's shoulders. The Halmoni, the comfort woman, was stroking the Japanese girl's head and muttering words into her ear. And it was a moment of incredible peace and blessing. And when the woman rejoined me, I said, do you feel better now? She said to me, the Halmoni said, you are not my enemy. You are my sister in Jesus Christ. We will bless one another and we will rise from this and we will go on in peace and victory. And it really, for her, it was both an extraordinary experience. In one very short encounter, she'd realized the horrors that she never knew about her own country, but she'd had them lifted from her shoulders by one of the victims of those horrors. And for me, that was a wonderful symbol of Christianity in action, of the peace of the gospel, the love of Christ, reaching out and actually even cancelling out the past for this woman. I've spoken too much, but I want to really just bring this right round to where we started. How, as people of faith, do we understand and respond to these horrible kind of things that we've been listening to? How do we go on and do something about it without being too overwhelmed, without actually knowing where to start or where to finish? How do we even make sense of it as Christians? And what do we do about the biblical text that we started out with? People often point out that horrible incidents against women are not condemned in the biblical text. It's just the way things are. And often that statement's followed up with references to biology, testosterone, male strength, the need for women to appease and so on, or submit before they get hurt. Sometimes the arguments hinge on patriarchal societies, on dominant attitudes, uh, where women are defined and kept in a subservient position. And all the Bible stories are doing, we're told, is to reinforce these attitudes and show how they will always be the case. This is the way the world is. Critics of Christianity even argue that because the treatment of women isn't condemned in the text, it obviously has God's approval. It's there in the Bible. These are stories. These are God's people. This is what they did to women. And they go on to ask, so why on earth would any woman want to worship a God who endorses their oppression? Very important questions. And I want to make three points in answers. First, we have to understand the difference in biblical narrative between prescription and description. The stories I listed earlier from the Hebrew scriptures are all descriptive. They're describing what did happen. They're not prescribing what should happen. And that's absolutely vitally important. The book of Judges, where you get the rape of the concubine, the gang rape of the concubine, um, as she's been brought home by the husband that she doesn't really want to live with because presumably he's a brutal man too, and she's taken from the guests from the host's house and raped all night and then dropped off. And then when he and his, um, his host get up in the morning, his concubine is dead on the doorstep. So he's very angry that she's been gang raped and cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends around the tribes of Israel and demands recompense. Horrible story. But the whole of the book of Judges is a catalog of horrible things, horrible things that people of Israel got wrong because they did what was right in their own eyes. 
And the whole of the book is about the cycle of evil, judgment, remorse, more evil, more judgment. And the cycle continues over and over again. We have to understand that these are not prescriptive chapters. They're just giving us a feel of what sin is like when it's writ large. The second point is that even though the text doesn't condemn the behavior, the full narrative lets us know that there is judgment. There is judgment in all of these cases. This is not because God is vengeful, but because there are always consequences to evil actions. So in the rape of Dinah, Shechem and all his men who raped her are killed by Dinah's brothers, who are so outraged at what takes place. In the rape of Tamar, Amnon is killed by his own brother Absalom. And the horrendous, massacre, the horrendous incident in Judges brings on a massacre. You've got to carry on reading the text, not stop at the end of that, that verse. The third point is that we interpret the Hebrew Scriptures through the New Testament. And notice a very different outcome in the story of the woman brought in adultery. She's not stoned, but she walks free. Why? Because Jesus challenges their selective reading of the Torah. Without entering into any argument with the people who are about to stone him, he simply points to a deeper hermeneutic which first engages the hearts and the attitudes of the would-be judges. Let he, him who is without sin, cast the first stone. That's really the heart of the Torah, our standing before God, not whether or not this woman has committed a misdemeanor. We do, he doesn't condemn her. He asks her to sin no more. And of course, there's much more to the story than that. In the 400 years between the end of the Hebrew Scriptures and the writing of the New Testament, so many more things have happened that have actually changed the interpretation of the Torah. If you read the bit of the law, the Torah where this um, stoning is actually offered as a punishment for adultery, two partners are stoned, not one. But one partner only is brought before Jesus and the people who are stoning her. So where's the man? Why isn't he there? And the answer, we don't know, because we're not told in the text. He might have given a bribe. He might have fled very quickly. He might have had friends in high places. A hundred reasons might be why he wasn't there, but he should have been if they were really applying the law. And the other interesting thing, of course, is that the woman walks free. She walks redeemed because Jesus does not condemn her but actually asks her to leave and prevents her assassination and tells her to sin no more. What happens to the man? Does he walk free? No, because he's not there facing the judgment. He's not there recognizing the sin that he's committed. He doesn't receive the freedom, the forgiveness from Jesus, and he carries the sin with him, presumably for the rest of his life. We have to understand the scriptures in a much fuller way than we often kind of give them credit for because they're very, very important in understanding and taking us in, especially in the New Testament, to the very heart of what's going on. But we also learn so much more about the script from the scriptures that helps us to understand violence against women. It helps us to understand us because the scriptures are also an account of our own humanity. Who are we? And we have to know where we are in the story of our humanity whenever we read any particular passage of Scripture. Our humanity is unfolded for us in these huge chapters of God's creation, our human significance, but our human fall, the sin that we choose in our own lives, and then Christ's redemption, where he forgives and dies for us and brings us back to a restored relationship with God and with the rest of life. So where in that passage in the scriptures do these passages occur? Are they part of creation? Are they part of sin? Are they part of redemption? And most of them, almost all of them, are nestled in that sin ethos, those sin chapters where they're describing who we are. 
So we have to understand ourselves in a bigger biblical framework. We have to understand us, ourselves as made in the image of God, male and female, to worship God for love and self-giving, for mutual protection and care, to build up, not to tear down, and so on. Made to care for the whole of creation. We're part of the creation that God's made. Um, and we're a very important and intrinsic part, and we have responsibility for the rest of creation. We have to go back to our biblical stories and recognize that violence isn't condemned, condoned in the scriptures. It doesn't have God's approval. We can't simply explain it in terms of biology, culture, testosterone. But what the Bible offers us is a much more profound understanding of who we are. As well as asking those questions, what kind of literature, what's the purpose of the text, what language it approximates and so on, um, we can also look at the big biblical narratives that we've just mentioned and ask where the story goes. And <laughs> I don't know why it's coming again. I can't move this on. Um, we also recognize that when we start to discuss the story of sin, all of the things that we've looked at are really enormous examples of sin in our world today. And human sin is actually choice and action that leads us away from God. Sin is manifest in our world today in global oppression. And who is most oppressed? Who suffers most from the sin of the world? And mostly, it's the vulnerable. Violence against women is part of that. And sin thrives through denial and delusion, through pretending it doesn't happen, pretending there is no sin, pretending things can be accounted for in another way. It grows through collusion in our world with the military, with economic, with political power. It's reinforced by systems of greed and evil. And if you look at all of the examples I've given you, you will find these things echoed in, wrapped up in the account of violence against women. I've argued all at the end of my book that unless we have a robust theology of sin, we will never understand violence against women because sin spoils all our relationships those central relationships with God, with each other, with the rest of creation. Sin never builds us up. It always destroys. It has no capacity other than to destroy. And it leads to hardness of heart, where there's no love, where there's ruthlessness, where there's indifference to others. And so as well as not being able to understand violence against women without a theology of sin, we also have to be real about what sin is. Sin isn't just immorality. Sin isn't just getting it wrong before God. Sin is all of these things writ large in our cultures, in our societies, in our own human heart. It's alienating. It's destructive. It's distortive. It takes truth and it turns it into half-truth, quarter-truth, and then downright lies. It's addictive. It takes us over. Where we lose freedom, it becomes habitual in our lives. It's generational. Sins pass down family lines. That's why we have to look very carefully at those families where violence already occurs because the children need to be protected because sin passes down generational lines. It's structural. It corrupts justice practices. It gets embedded in social institutions, even in institutions of societies where there are laws. Sin is present. It's delusory. We believe our own propaganda. We actually kid ourselves. We tell ourselves a story that's not true, and it's insistent. And unless we recognize that all of these things are subject in our own societies, we will never fully understand or be able to overcome violence against women. I used to bang on about sin when I was in lecture with the Open University. <laughs> My social science colleagues got really fed up with me. And they said, oh, that's what we really don't like about Christians. We hate this word sin. It's so maudling. It's so miserable, so moralistic. And I said, you're completely wrong. It's a very, very hopeful concept. And they said, rubbish. Come on, Elaine. And I said, look, we all agree, and because they were good social scientists, good people, we all agree that the world is in a mess. We all agree our own culture is in a mess. There's greed, there's rampant, um, there's exploitation and so on. But what have you got to say about it? If this is the very best humanity can do, we are in a mess. We're doomed. That's all you can say. You know, tanker a little bit here with politics, a few more economic handouts here, better education. But when that doesn't produce the goods, what then? 
But for me as a Christian, sin does not have the last word. It doesn't have the last word because there is always a possibility of redemption. There always is the truth that God takes sin on in God's own self and Christ dies for us. So for me, it opens the door to a new future because once we recognize that this is sin and begin repentance and penitence and open our hearts for change, change is possible. And I think that when we read the New Testament, we see that writ large in the life of Jesus, in the ministry of Jesus, in the early church and so on. And it's something that we hold on to powerfully today, that Jesus does restore human dignity in dying for us and forgiving us and giving this mission to the church. He opens up, challenging the inherent patriarchal cultures, all of the things that give rise to the issues that we've looked at today um, are possible for us to work in the kingdom of God as good citizens of God's kingdom. And this is also what's happening, and this is why I want to end very quickly on this note of hope, that Christians across the globe are addressing violence against women because they understand what sin is, and they don't feel destroyed by sin. They don't feel rooted in powerlessness. They get off their bottoms and start working and actively asking for the power and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Whether it's Heal Africa, and I've got such enormous respect for this wonderful hospital that's doing so many amazing things, picking little girls up like Amina, who was gang raped and left for dead until they brought her into the hospital and delivered her wee baby. And now she's, um, she's a young woman uh, who has a tremendous ministry of love and power, whether they're recovering from fistula wards, whether they're patrolling the streets, helping protecting schoolgirls against rape, whether they're showing workshops to again empower women to say no, to stop gender-based violence. And they're just one of many organizations that I've come across. There's the International Justice Mission, very active here in Canada. There's the groups at home uh, looking to ratify the Istanbul Convention. I haven't got time to go into all of that. It's a very wonderful organization, again, run by Christians, young Christians, your age about, um, who've got the spirit of God to continue to do this. There's our own organization that we began, uh, Restored, which has this incredible outfit called First Man Standing, which gathers Christian men together to say, not on our patch, not in our name, we will not tolerate violence against women. And they have active strategies to empower men to stand against it. And they are doing incredible, valuable work that you really have to admire. Um, and we have uh, many other areas. This is an initiative against sexual exploitation. Again, women coming together and, and men to, to look at how we can actually uh, bring an end to all of this. I think Press Red is something that just happened last year after a big conference where God had touched the hearts of something like 200 people who all started their own initiatives in their own families and neighborhoods and churches to actually start working against violence against women. Um, this is Joe and, uh, and Lynn Lucy, who set up Heal Africa because the Spirit of God told them to do this and who have labored for 40 years in that culture, a war-torn, broken culture with joy and peace. Lynn died of cancer tragically uh, a couple of years ago. I've been writing her biography with her before she died. It's very difficult to finish that biography right without her. Um, but actually, their lives and their ministry symbolize something that's so vitally important. And I want to finish with this photograph. This is a soap-making factory in a place called Baraka. All the women who work in the soap-making factory are women who have been raped as a weapon of war, violated, thrown out of their families, their damaged goods, nobody wants them. So they work together and they produce soap. Um, and I went to see the soap making factory. I'm there somewhere. You can see, see me. I'm the only white face. Um, and to see if we could trade with them. And the, uh, the man at the back holding what looks like a very large thermometer, I just want you to focus on him for a minute because he's very significant. So who is he? Well, he's an elder from a local Baptist church and had heard that the factory was a soap making factory. It was a full of abused women <clears throat> who had been violated. And here is a Christian elder in a Baptist church who's never raped a woman and never dream of raping a woman and goes along to see if they can buy their soap. 
my church would like to buy your soap, he says. Um, and other churches do. And they said, wonderful, let me show you around the factory. The factory is a hovel, really. It's not brilliant at all. He was worried when he was going around the factory because the soap, as it was bubbling up, was very, very acidic. And the girl who was taking the acidic temperature, the acidic gum, they got to monitor this in the soap, had, her hands were being eaten away by the acid. And it worried him. And he said, why, you must have gloves. It's ruining your hands. And they said, if we bought gloves, we would have no profits. Our profits would be wiped out. We can't afford these. He went away and prayed, uh, talked to the el other elders, came back the next day and said, we would like to trade with you. But I will come every morning and I will test the acidity of your soap. And I will bring my own gloves. And so that's what he does. He goes in every day. He tests the acidity of the soap. And his hands do despite the gloves of being worn away by the acid. Wonderful man. When I was there, they were curious to know why I came all the way from England, <coughs> a, ri <coughs> a rich white woman, to their soap-making factory to trade. And I said, because the love of Jesus Christ constrains me, because Christ loves you, and Christ um, it, it wants to stand alongside you in the pain that you've undergone because it was wrong, what has happened to you has been fundamentally wrong. And as a Christian, I want to be here um, as Christ's ambassador to be with you too and to do whatever I can. And as I was talking about Jesus Christ, this woman here with the big red checks on her, sh on her shirt <coughs> said, oh, I know Jesus Christ. Uh, I've met him. So this is curious because the women were not churchgoers or church attenders. And I said, oh, really? And she said, yes, he comes in every morning at 11 o'clock and takes the acidity of our soap. This man has never preached a sermon to them. All he does is turn up. Uh, they know him for who he is, who is a God follower. Um, and his legacy m means so much to the women in that place. Jesus comes that we might have life and life in abundance. Many of these women have no life, far less in abundance. We are the people of God. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. It's our job to do what we can on our watch in our era to bring Christ's love and redemptive hope to those who are suffering. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Storkey, for ensuring that none of us can leave here tonight saying, I never knew. Thank you for having your heart broken for the things that break Jesus' heart. And we know it has come at a great cost and price for you to do the work that you've done and to be able to come here and articulate so clearly and so heartfeltly what is happening in the lives of so many women around the world. We are very, very grateful. Thank you. Tonight, before we end, we have a guest here all the way from Amsterdam. Dr. Reverend Lauren Bethel is here to respond shortly to Elaine Storkey's lecture. Reverend Bethel has been working for more than three decades on behalf of and caring for women and children who have been exploited and abused. In 1987, she was the first director of the New Life Center in Chiang Mai, Thailand, which is a center that offers education, vocational training, and new life to girls that were trying to escape trafficking and prostitution. Lauren currently works as a global consultant with grassroots organizations, encouraging the development of projects and networks around the world that are dealing with the issues of prostitution, trafficking, and other forms of abuse and exploitation of children and women. Lauren is well decorated and has received many awards, including from former President Jimmy Carter for the amazing work that she has done around the world. And we're very privileged to hear her respond as a grassroots practitioner who has walked in this filth and darkness for decades and has seen hope and light and been a part of making that happen. So Lauren, we welcome you now. It's really an incredible honor to be here. And uh, as you can imagine, a bit intimidating to speak after Elaine Storkey. Um, I adore this woman and uh, have known her for quite a while and uh, have just, um, just have such an incredible appreciation for her. Um, I read her book and I wondered how on earth, and this is a discussion we're gonna have to have sometime, how she dealt with her secondary trauma in um, 
in telling the stories and hearing the stories, hearing story after story after story of the women. And uh, I was gratified to hear her say that it took her eight years to write the book <laughs> because I thought, there's no way. I, I had to keep putting the book down or going and getting a glass of wine or um, doing something <laughs> to get through it myself. And I have heard my own share of uh, stories, as you can imagine, over the past 30 years. But, um, but thank you. Thank you for doing that, for enlightening us, and for, um, it was an incredible journey that I know you went through, and that, um, and such an important, important work for the world to have, um, to tell the stories, because I, I truly believe, as I, be, I think you do, that it's, it's all about the story. It's all about the story of the women. It's all about being, as we as privileged people, um, being listeners of the stories, um, of being present to hear the stories, um, to let those stories be told, and then to make sure that the world knows the stories. If we can do nothing else, if we think that we are totally helpless, that we are um, overwhelmed by the issues, that we cannot do anything, the least we can do is find somebody to let them tell their story and to walk with them on the journey. And um, I, that's the, one of the things I was just struck with in listening to her, reading the book and listening to her again. I just like to tell a couple of stories, my own stories. Um, some of people were asking about my jacket um, that I'm wearing. I just have to tell the story about the jacket. It um, is from the Akha um, culture. Uh, I don't know if many of you have been to Northern Thailand or Burma or Southern China, the Akha culture. When I went to Thailand in 1987 and learned about the plight of young tribal women who were coming down from the hills of northern, of, um, from northern Thailand in order to receive, in order to find jobs, in order to support their families, because that's a huge issue. A girl who's raised in a culture who believes that it is her responsibility from the time she is born to support her family, and then having very little education, no vocational skills, um, not even speaking the local language, not the Thai language. They were just ripe for picking for traffickers to come into the, um, when they came into the cities. And so um, a project, we started a project in northern Thailand and so that girls could have an education, vocational training, and Christian education. And I think those are three major components in especially dealing with the issues of human trafficking is offering girls education and um, and help them to understand how valuable they were in the eyes of God. In the Akka culture, the girls used to come to me. They were, the Akka girls were the largest percentage of tribal girls in Thailand who were working in prostitution, um, mostly trafficked um, in order to, thinking that they were getting jobs to support their families. So the Akka, very, very vulnerable young girls. And they used to tell me that in their culture, they were worth nothing. They were worth absolutely nothing. And um, that's what they would tell me. They said, we're not, we have no value um, at all. We are married off, they were married off when they were 12, 13, 14 years old. Um, they, uh, and they were powerless to do anything about that. They, um, the fathers would sell the girls, especially if the fathers or mothers were opium or heroin addicted, they would be sold. And uh, I had a, one young girl who we um, helped facilitate her rescue from prostitution, 13 years old, Boonong. And she, um, I interviewed her father one time. There was a, a crew, a, med, a, a very famous um, news cast organization who came through and she volunteered. She wanted to tell her story. And so we went up to the hills and met with, um, I, I said, I'm gonna have to take you because your father needs to be a part of this, this story. And so we went up to the hills. Her father was laying there smoking opium. He had sold her twice into prostitution. And uh, she was receiving an education from us and was on a really good track. And she said, uh, I just asked her, um, and I asked her father through her. She was having to translate for me. And um, I said, why do you sell your daughter into prostitution when you know that she could die, 
that she could get AIDS, that she would be violated, that she would be, she was being incredibly exploited and abused, and yet you sold her twice. Why did you do that? And he said, through her, he said, because whatever my daughter, um, my daughter's purpose in life is to do whatever um, is, brings me satisfaction or brings me or helps me in some way. That is the reason my daughter was born into this world, and that is the purpose that she has. And if she dies because she's in the, in the process of doing something to help me, then so be it. And he said that. It was on television. And she had translated it for me. Um, and it was very, very difficult for all of us to hear that. But that was the situation for so many of the girls. They were raised in cultures to believe that they were economically responsible for the family and that the parents felt that they were, that was their purpose in life. And so I would talk to the girls. I would say over and over, I'd say, what, what can, you know that you are created in the image of God. You are so precious in God's sight. And how can we help your culture to understand that? How can we understand that? And they said, Lauren, there's nothing you can do about that. But we can. We can. And I've had the luxury of having watched people through those 30 years, watch those young women grow and um, watch them receive education, watch them um, heal, watch them have families, get married, um, have uh, be active leaders in their churches. And um, just uh, in July of this year, um, we had a reunion and 70 of our former residents of the New Life Center from the days when I was there showed up at that reunion. And they surprised me by having this jacket made for me. They were all alumni. And what was even more, I mean, so it's very, as you can imagine, very, very special for me. Um, but what was really incredibly gratifying is that while I was in Thailand um, in July, I also had the opportunity to go up to Burma to visit one of our alumni who had returned to Burma. She had been born there, raised there, and then came to Thailand, received an education, and then went back uh, through the New Life Center, and then went back up to Burma because she felt powerfully called by God to go back and to help the young girls in her part of Burma, where she was born and raised, that were vulnerable and did not have an opportunity to uh, receive an education. And so she was going back. And now, as I learned at that reunion, many of those young girls, young women who were at the reunion, were actually paying and sponsoring that project up in Burma. They were paying it forward. They were the next generation. And their children will not be trafficked into prostitution because their mothers know, have an education, because their mothers are aware of their value as precious and beloved daughters of God. And also, and dear Bunong, she, has, she married an Australian man, moved to Australia, and is doing very, very well there. She and her husband came back for the reunion. It was wonderful to spend time with them. One of the things she did during the month that she was in, um, in um, Thailand, she went with a contingent of New Life Center um, residents and former staff up to Laos because they're looking to start a new project up there as well um, amongst vulnerable Akha um, young people in that very, in a very, very poor and very risky region. So I'm just leaving you tonight very simply with a message of hope um, that people's cultures can change that women can know freedom, can know, even though they've had incredibly devastating lives, um, can know hope and can know a bright future for themselves and their families, especially when they come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, as their Redeemer, as their, the, um, the one who created them in God's image. And it's, um, so I'm just honored to stand here tonight and to just share that little story. I could tell you many more, but um, I'm just so thankful for Elaine and for hearing your message. And um, 
God bless us all. I'm going to just close the evening and to say thank you for your attention. These are hard uh, stories to hear, but um, gr grateful for the ways in which you unpack them within the context of the gospel. I wanted to say also that there are is information about the school um, and some of the lectures and other things that are happening this year on the table over there on the left. And I wanted to welcome you to come back tomorrow evening for the second lecture um, when we will hear from Dr. Storkey once again. So thank you again so much, both of you, for your words this evening. I'm grateful. You're dismissed.